Taylor Lorenz, otherwise known as the Greenwich Doxer, or the most hated journalist alive, is a successful tech columnist that's worked from everyone from the Washington Post to the New York Times, recently embroiled in many controversies. One moment having emotional outbursts on TV about people online using the slightest bit of information to ruin people's lives to a month later, subjecting others to the very thing she was so emotional about. The question is, what are the Greenwich Doxer's motives? How did she become the most hated journalist alive? And is she hiding something dark she doesn't want the public to find out? You feel like any little piece of information that gets out on you will be used by the worst people on the internet to destroy your life. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's overwhelming. It's really hard. Taylor Lorenz. Taylor Lorenz. Taylor Lorenz. <laughs> Taylor has taken the position that it is always wrong to dox people, to invite harassment against people. And I think, I, and I, I wonder if she has thought through whether what she is doing is not that exact thing. And it does seem true, from what we feel about it, that if Taylor had written an article without the doxing, without the. October 21st, 1984, New York City. Taylor Lorenz is born daughter of Walter R. Lorenz Jr. and mother Annie Lurie Lorenz. According to publicly available property ownership records, in 1988, the couple moved to Greenwich, Connecticut, the wealthiest town in the state. Greenwich, Connecticut is known as the gateway to New England the first town many people pass through when entering the nutmeg state. Greenwich is world-renowned due to its close proximity to New York City, approximately 28 miles, its 70 miles of shoreline, and its stunning natural beauty. Greenwich is a diverse community attracting everyone who seek a superb East Coast lifestyle. In 2009, while living in Riverside, Taylor Lorenz was introduced to the platform that would massively affect the trajectory of her life. Um, how did you become interested in the beat? In 2009, I was I graduated into the recession, like many millennials. Yeah. Uh, I was working a bunch of um, t temp jobs. I was working at a call center. This girl at one of my temp jobs introduced me to Tumblr, and that was kind of a very life changing moment because it, I was I got obsessed with Tumblr, and I was on Tumblr 24 seven basically. I ended up getting a little bit of an audience on Tumblr. A lot of media people followed okay. me. And this is when Taylor started to morph into the person we see today. That is when she first came to the realization of what she wanted to do with her life. Taylor's interest for social media led her to spending a year at an ad agency. She left in 2011 for the first job that could break her into the world of traditional media. Running the social media accounts for the Daily Mail, getting her that much closer to the role of the people in the media that was her Tumblr following, the people she most admired. After working for the Daily Mail for three years, she made her next career-defining move by getting her first writing position at the Daily Dot, even managing to slip in some nepotism on the way out for her sister, Brooke Lorenz, by getting her an intern position at the Daily Mail. Taylor only ended up working at the Daily Dot for a brief period, quickly abandoning ship for a much more prestigious position at Business Insider as their technology reporter. These memers operate as independent media companies and they have distribution much bigger, you know, than a lot of traditional media companies. Some of them have over tens of thousands of millions of, sorry, tens of millions of followers each. After three years working for Business Insider, developing her craft, Taylor hopped to the hill and then the Daily Beast and finally landing at one of her most prestigious roles yet, the technology reporter for the New York Times. Doing some pretty decent work on meme stocks and showing some growing potential. 
meme stocks have been around for a while. You mentioned Elon and Chamath, also both huge influencers. And what it's, what's popular in this community is kind of ironic stocks. It's really playing on nostalgia and it's kind of sometimes a joke, you know, like, wouldn't it be funny if those are those are ones that uh, people seem interested in. But somewhere along the road, Taylor Lorenz seemed to want to be more close to the center of attention. Instead of just letting the story do the talking, she wanted to be the story herself. She wanted to be a brand, something the New York Times wasn't going to allow. Now one of you will be the drowning victim and the other one gets to be our lifesaver. I'll be the victim all your life. January 26th, 2021. Taylor Lorenz publishes an article on Medium titled, Clubhouse Moderation Issues and Incidents. One can only assume she published it on Medium because the New York Times wasn't fond of the reporting style. In the article, she admits to lurking various voice chat groups, accumulating proof of things she considers inappropriate, demanding policy change, saying she will be leaving the platform till the issue is fixed, only to find herself back on the platform lurking more chat rooms and looking for dirt shortly after. Telling a reporter at Wired that she enjoyed being in smaller chat rooms and talking to younger people, confessing to spending four hours a day on Clubhouse, and saying, I became tight friends with them and loved hanging out on the app. Blocked and reported. Not everyone on the platform was so fond of her though, because numerous individuals blocked her as to probably avoid being a part of whatever hit piece she was constructing. And they weren't exactly wrong to be speculating as such, but Taylor didn't take too kindly to being treated to the button she seems to love to use so much on Twitter because she ended up making alternative accounts to continue lurking on the individuals who blocked her, like one venture capitalist, Mark Anderson, where she came running to Twitter to claim that he had been openly using the r slur in a group chat on the platform. But the moderator of the conversation called her out, as well as many others, to say what she had claimed was in fact false. Even being called out on her use of burner accounts to bypass the blocking system, which Taylor even admitted to doing in since deleted tweets. This feverish reporting and lashing out on social media clearly wasn't the right image for the New York Times because she ended up leaving the prestigious paper over a mutual disagreement on whether or not reporters should be trying to become a brand and how they should conduct themselves on social media. Um, and of course, the main reason you went to the Post uh, was to build your brand, right? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, I, for people who may not know the backstory here, um, you made what I thought was a relatively obvious point uh, to Business Insider a few weeks ago that the future of media is more distributed, more about journalists building their own brand and audience, and the longer you stay at a job that restricts you from outside opportunities, as institutions like the New York Times sometimes do, um, the less relevant your brand becomes. Absolutely, and and let me be clear, like, I mean, not to toot my own horn, but I'm a good journalist. Like, I break a ton of news. Like, if I have a brand, it's being an authoritative source on my beat and knowing that I'm going to deliver consistent scoops and good stories. She ended up leaving her position at the New York Times and moving over to the Washington Post as a columnist covering technology and online culture, which was an interesting choice, to say the least. But how has Taylor seemed to effortlessly weave her way in and out of media companies? Is there something here I'm missing, perhaps? Well, to get to the bottom of it, we have to go back to the beginning. Which brings me to this. About those people in the media that were following her. Was it because of her wonderful Tumblr blogging skills on the misunderstanding of furries? Or was there another reason she had all those media connections? Which raises an even more interesting question. How has she come to live such a life of privilege and luck? Well, when you peel back the layers, the answer 
starts to become quite clear. Her father, Walter Lorenz, is the COO of Hobbs Inc., a high-end construction company, and his wife, Taylor's mother, has some interesting ties herself. Her grandfather, Walter F. Lindbergh, was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives, but there is still a more interesting connection Taylor has that not so many people know about. This former church is filled with treasures from the past, but it might also hold a key to the future. So this sound has been digitized. Yes, and a lot of the uh, music that we've been digitizing just hasn't been on the internet ever. The place is home to a nonprofit called the Internet Archive. They want to be a digital library for everything. And I mean everything. One of the key tools one might use to do research and reporting for a job like Taylor has, or even for a video like you're watching right now, would have to be the Wayback Machine, a tool made by the Internet Archive for searching deleted and old versions of web pages, useful for looking at deleted tweets and altered articles. But when someone tries to run a search on, let's say, Taylor's Twitter account, you are presented with this page. Sorry, this page has been excluded from the Wayback Machine, which isn't something you're presented with often while using the tool. So, that makes one ask oneself, why is a prominent journalist's Twitter account excluded from the Wayback Machine? Well, let me introduce to you Roger Gregory McDonald. Taylor's paternal uncle, and the most interesting piece of the puzzle yet, founder of the Television Archive, a subsystem of the Internet Archive, just like the Wayback Machine. So now, the reason why her tweets are unarchivable and unable to be queried by the tool becomes quite clear. But that introduces another question. Is this the only thing about her that's being excluded from the archive? Is there something being hidden about her life or past she doesn't want people to know? I don't know Homer Simpson. I, I never met Homer Simpson or had any contact with him, but... <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I can't go on. <laughs> that's okay. Your tears say more than real evidence ever could. April 1st. 2022, MSNBC airs a sense-removed piece on online harassment, featuring Taylor Lorenz, now a columnist at Bezos-owned Washington Post. The piece details the harassment reporters can endure when the shoe gets on the other foot and they become the story. Female reporters are often at the center of the bullseye. 73% of women journalists saying they've experienced online attacks, while 30% say it has impacted their work. Journalist Taylor Lorenz is a columnist for the Washington Post and was targeted nearly one year ago in a segment on Fox News. Now we told you about Taylor Lorenz last night in a segment about how the most privileged in our society now consider themselves oppressed. And Taylor Lorenz is certainly a shining example of that principle. A New York Times reporter from Greenwich telling you what a victim she is. Researchers found that attacks against Lorenz went up as much as 144% after just one Twitter thread. Lorenz and digital reporter Kate Sawson say these types of attacks have changed their lives. You feel like any little piece of information that gets out on you will be used by the worst people on the internet to destroy your life. And it's so isolating. I'm so sorry. You're fine. You're <laughs> it's overwhelming. Fine. It's really hard. April 19th, 2022, Taylor Lorenz publishes an article for the Washington Post titled, Meet the Woman Behind Libs of TikTok, Secretly Fueling the Rights Outrage Machine. In the article, Taylor fully doxed the anonymous woman behind the Twitter account Libs of TikTok, including her full name, address, and real estate license. The piece was constructed in such a poor manner that it seemed like it was just a thinly veiled opinion piece to justify the publication of information 
information on an individual they don't like in an attempt to intimidate and silence them. And not even a month after crying on national television for a lesser problem of a similar nature. Last year, unbeknownst to pretty much nobody, a woman in Brooklyn started a Twitter account that was comprised almost solely of videos of liberals talking about themselves. The idea was to let activist types describe in their own words what they believe, unfiltered. Bezos's personal newspaper, The Washington Post, decided to harass the family of the woman who operates libs of TikTok. They couldn't find her, so they went after her family. The Washington Post published a piece by Lorenz linking to the name, the physical address, and the real estate licensing information of the woman who runs libs of TikTok. Now, I can see why even the New York Times didn't want anything to do with her. And it seems like the patience of the Washington Post could be waning thin as well. June 2nd, 2022, Taylor Lorenz publishes an article titled, Who Won the Depp Heard Trial? Content Creators That Went All In, in which she criticizes the motives behind content creators that covered the Amber Heard Johnny Depp trial, specifically legal bites and that umbrella guy, saying that they had highly profited from covering the story and insinuating that was the main reason for their coverage, excluding that one had been covering the situation all year and the other ran a legal channel. The article also claimed that the post had reached out for comment, but no such attempt had been made. In the article, she's quoted writing, every big news event becomes an opportunity to amass followers, money, and clout. If I were to do an episode on uh, creators in the creator economy, who'd be most interesting for me to talk to? Um, I got to think on that because I think when I think of big content creators, a lot of them are the most toxic people in the world. Um, I mean, your Casey- PewDiePie's, your- <laughs> PewDiePie's not even as bad as, you know, the Jake Pauls, the, Jake, the, Mr. the Paul Mr. Brother. Beast, you know. Yeah. Um, After being caught in a hard place regarding the claim to have reached out during the article, she insisted an editor had actually inserted that and it wasn't her fault and that she is a victim of a bad faith campaign. CNN's Oliver Darcy was live tweeting about the situation in a thread where Taylor Lorenz responded saying, No, actually, this type of coverage is so irresponsible and dangerous. It's misrepresenting my words to amplify a manufactured outrage campaign by right-wing media and radicalized influencers. What Oliver Darcy is doing is standard reporting. He sent legitimate questions to the Post and the Post responded, scrutiny by fellow journalists is not the same as a smear campaign by crusaders. After the incident of falsely claiming to have reached out for comment, even more outrage started to brew in Taylor's direction. And with Taylor only being at the Washington Post for a couple of months and already causing public outrage on multiple occasions, it seemed like the Washington Post started to notice that they might have gotten more than they have bargained for. That's when Taylor's former employer, the New York Times, published an article titled Infighting Overshadows Big Plans at the Washington Post, in which they are quoted saying, Miss Lorenz has been moved from the feature staff to the technology team, according to three people with knowledge of the move. Mr. Barr has been asked to review her articles before publication. Now that mutual departing from the New York Times makes a lot more sense now. Taylor seems to be pretty serious about trying to brandify herself at the expense of her reporting, and her motives beyond that are questionable. Once you step back and take a look at this from afar, you could see exactly why Taylor Lorenz is like this, and perhaps even the motives behind it. I don't think there's some sort of grand mystery here. She has clearly realized over the years during her obsessive reporting and using of various social media platforms how to stoke outrage and claim victim status as a weapon. If you're looking to watch more grifters like Taylor Lorenz, may I suggest this video on Patrice Cullors, the co-founder of Black Lives Matter.